Amen. Hallelujah. There's none holy like our God. God, we honor you in this place this morning. As your sons, your daughters, we acknowledge that you are holy, you're separated, you're in a class all by yourself, Baba. And we reverence your presence this morning. We magnify your name this morning. Did you receive all the praise, God, that was given to you this morning in this little section of your big church? And we thank you, God. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. You're holy. You're in a class of your own. You're holy, God. We bless you. God, I thank you for your servant, Bishop, this morning, Pastor Brenda. In the assignment that you've put them on, I pray that you give them the strength to do that which you've called them to do today. May they not shrink back, my God. May they honor your guidance and your direction, Holy Spirit. You pour into them, Lord God, as they pour into your people. And God, I'm just a vessel. You know that, I tell you that every time, God. I'm just a vessel and I'm so humbled and so honored that you use me. Because it's not about Ruth, it's all about you, Jesus. And so I pray that as I share what you shared with me, I pray that your children will hear your heart and not dwell on the vessel, but dwell on the one who created the vessel. And so receive the glory, Baba. I worship you. And I honor you and I magnify you. And Lord, I, I lift up Ashley and Jason today. And God, I'm not a parent. So I don't understand the depth of what they're feeling today but I know I'm feeling it, so I can't imagine where they are. We thank you for the miracle of Christian grace, Baba. And we don't understand it, God. I'll be the first to honestly say it. I don't know why you let her come for just three and a half months and then you took her. But I do know that you're holy. And I, knew, I do know that you're sovereign. And I know, Baba, that there is absolutely, positively no way that you can make a mistake. Mm -mm. You're above mistakes, my God. And so bringing her was not a mistake. Keeping her was not a mistake. And taking her home yesterday, Baba, it was not a mistake. And so, God, we trust you. But we lift up her parents. This young couple, God, we lift up her sisters and her grandparents and her auntie Kim and all the rest of the family, God. And God, I pray that in your own way and in your own timing, God, that you give them the grace they need and you give them the answers that you want to give them. But hold them in the palm of your hand, Baba, don't let them go. Hold Ashley, hold Jason, don't let them go, Baba. They will not lose their They will not lose their mind. They're kept by the Father. They're surrounded by Jesus. So bless them, God. And Lord, as we turn to your word now, may you bless us. May your people hear what you have to say, Baba. We love you, we bless you, we honor you. In your holy and righteous name we pray. And all God's children said, Amen and Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you for pressing and joining in with me this morning, almost afternoon. Good to see you, those on the live stream. Good to see you as well. Um, as Elder Marshall said, my name is Ruth Barassa. Um, <laughs> super proud of my name. Um, 
And it's just such an honor to be here today with you. Uh, Bishop asked that I would just share today as he's out doing what the Lord has asked him to do. And so I'm going to do that. Um, we're going to get started. You know, one of the, um, the things that God has been showing me or just talking to me about really, I don't necessarily say showing me, um, over the last couple months is that he has me, right? That there's nowhere I go that he doesn't already pop up, that he's not already there, right? And so he has encircled me. And he's encircled every one of you here who is his, right? It's important to know who he encircles, and we'll look at that. Um, and so that's what I want to just share just a little bit, just a couple, couple nuggets of what God has been showing me about that specific talk, about him encircling us. One of my, um, I call it my chill, give me chill Psalms is Psalms 139. And in Psalms 139, verse 1 through 6, the psalmist declares this. He says, Lord, you have searched me and known me. Amen. You know when I sit down, you know when I stand up, you understand my thoughts from a far away, you observe my travel and my rest, you're aware of all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, oh, I can read over here, you know all about it, Lord. And, and isn't that just amazing about our God? Because that's really how he is, right? And you look at that top picture and that tailor who is precisely measuring the material and precisely knowing how the pattern has to work. And that's what God does with our lives. Each one of us, he precisely measures us, right? And then the psalmist goes on and he says, you have encircled me. I love that. You have placed your hand on me. And that's what God does. He encircles us. And he places his hands on us. Some psalms, um, some, some versions, they say, you have hemmed me in. And you see that tailor there in that picture. He's hemming in, right? And that's what God does. He hems us in. And then I love what the psalmist declares. He says, this wondrous knowledge, it's, it's, too, it's beyond me. It's too deep. I can't get it. And I love that about our God, right? He encircles us. And that's amazing about it. And so one of the things, um, when I think about encircling, when I think about God encircling us or surrounding us, I think about a mosquito net. And you're probably thinking, really, you do? I do. Uh, <laughs> growing up in Kenya, we, depending on what part of the country we were, we were in and what season, because the rainy seasons, of course, are worse, for mosquitoes to, come, to attack. And so we had to sleep under mosquito nets, like this precious little baby boy or girl. I don't know what gender this baby is. I just know this baby's cute. Um, and so, you know, if you were risky and decided, I don't need a mosquito net, I can figure it out. I got the anointing of God. Okay, so you sleep without your mosquito net, and then you are either wrestling with the mosquitoes all night who are trying to sting you, or what we call bite you, direct translation from Swahili, trying to bite you, or their harmonious, annoying, irritating song is humming at your ear all night long because they're attracted to the wax, wax in the ear, if you just wonder why they, they go for the ears. And, but the worst of it is you are risking contracting Malaria, which is having had bouts of malaria in my life growing up, it is one of the worst illnesses to go through. I've had American, I call it American because nobody else really calls the flu this but America, but American flu and the malaria is at least a hundred times worse. And so that's the risk you face, right? Do you know, I was looking it up, you probably don't know, but I was looking up and I started, I think I went back to 2017 and then ended right about, and ended in 2021 because there's no results yet for 2022. But do you realize, do you know that 600 plus people across the world in every one of those years died of malaria? 
600,000 plus people. They said it was worse during the years of COVID. Uh, they didn't really give a reason, or at least I didn't find a reason why, but what I think is they couldn't get to the medication, and couldn't get to doctors. And so it went up by about 63,000 more people in 2020 and 2021 who died of this horrible illness because not everyone, but a lot of people because they didn't have a mosquito net, right? There was nothing surrounding them when they sleep. And so if you're trying to figure out what is mo very important to me this year, I don't know why this year it's, God has just put it so hard on me, is I want to get as many mosquito nets out to the nations in Africa and Asia and the Middle East as I can because we're gonna put a stop to this nonsense called malaria, right? And so the thing about the net though is it has to be in the right place at the right time for the right duration. You can't just have say, oh, I have a mosquito net. That doesn't work that way, right? What do I mean? It has to be in the right place. It has to be over the area that you sleep and it has to drape the ground. It can't hang any bit above the ground. It has to drape your ground. And then the other thing about the mosquito net, it has to be put at the right time. When it starts getting evening and the, the sun is just about starting to go down, you've got to get your mosquito net down. Because during the day, we tie them up, right? So, can you, cause you, so you can make your bed or whatever. But at that time, your mosquito net has got to go in place. And if you're late, the mosquitoes are already waiting for you inside. The, the third thing is the right duration. It has to be all night. You can't say, I've been good till 1, 1 a.m., so I don't need any more mosquito in it and just hang it up. They're coming for you, okay? So you gotta be at the right time, the right place, and the right duration. Now, sometimes you can be as careful as you want, right? You have it at the right place. You, you, Evening comes, you're throwing your mosquito net down so you can cover. But sometimes, especially if your mosquito net has any kind of holes on it, or if it's not draped properly at the bottom of your bed or wherever you sleep, one or two mosquitoes might come in your net and what I call attack you as you're sleeping, right? But here's what I love about our God. And the psalmist, he describes God as surrounding his people. I love that. He says, God surrounds us like Jerusalem, like the mountains surround Jerusalem. It's the next slide. And the beauty of it all is this. Let me read this before we go to the actual uh, scripture. So I, was, I looked up a little bit about that particular scripture and I realized there was a gentleman called Robinson. I, can't, I, didn't, I didn't find his first name, but Peter Lange, one of my favorite comment, commentaries, if you're like, which one do you like? I got about 70, but this is one. <laughs> uh, so this is one of my favorites. So Peter Lange says this, uh, uh, Robinson says this, Peter Lange writes it. The sacred city, talking about Jerusalem, it lies upon the broad and the high mountain range, which is shut in by two valleys, Jehoshaphat and Hinnom. Hinnom is a very wicked valley. If we can get to it, we'll talk about it. If not, you can look it up. All the surrounding hills are higher. In the east, Mount Olive. On the south, the so-called Hill of Evil Council. We'll talk about that. Which ascends from the Valley of Hinnom on the west. The ground rises gently to the border of the great Wadi, or Mount Zion, as described above. While in the north, the bend of a ridge, Mount Moriah, or now called Temple Mount, which adjoins the Mount of Olives. These four mountains, Robinson says, they limit the view to the distance of about a mile and a half, a mile and a half, where the enemy cannot see into Jerusalem because of these four mountains, right? And so the psalmist, he describes God and he says this, and I love the direct translation out of Hebrew. I love this one. It says, if you, if you translate it directly out of what, what is written in Hebrew into English, it says, Jerusalem, mountains are around it. And Yahweh, he is around his people from now and forever. 
Amen. And the ESV, which is probably what you're familiar to hearing some of it like this, uh, verse 2 of Psalm 125, it says, As the mountains surround Jerusalem, hallelujah, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forevermore. Amen. And so that word surround or around or encircle, in Hebrew it's uh, savab. Go back for just a second. And that, that Hebrew word is savab, and it means surrounding or to circuit on all sides or around about, and the root is sab, right? So it just talks about what God does. He encircles us as his children. And the thing I love about our God is that like a mosquito net, he does surround us. I, I, I don't disagree with that, right? He surrounds us like a mosquito net. But the thing about our God, his hedge, there are no holes. Nothing gets through him. No demon, no wicked person, nothing. His net is intact. His hedge is perfect, right? And so you don't have to worry and say, oh my gosh, it's evening, Elder Herb. I forgot to bring it down. I forgot to tell the Lord to release his net. He's already taken care of it, right? That's the beauty of the God who surrounds us. Amen. And so, you know, sometimes we get ahead of God, right? And we think, God, you've been encircling me, and that's great, and I love it and everything, but um, I think I got it from here, right? And we start saying, I need something, God, that you don't have. But what we don't realize is everything we need is in that net. It's in the circle where he surrounds us. You need an example? Okay. Psalm 32, 7. The psalmist says, talking of the Lord, you are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Why did God give them shouts of deliverance? Scholars believe that the shouts of deliverance, this is one of the debates that goes on, or discussions, that goes on, they say, the shouts of deliverance were all from the Lord. And then there's a group of scholars who say, no, the shouts of deliverance are the people cheering on who know the Lord is there. Either way, it's shouts of deliverance. So why does God give shouts of deliverance? Because he knows that's what we need, right? So he sends the deliverance. He sends the intercessors who pray, who scream out, who call out to him with shouts and songs of deliverance. Why? Because that's where you are and that's what you need. And so every day when we're on the phone line at 7 a.m., 8 a.m., 9 a.m., 10 a.m., 11 a.m., I'm going to say all the time so you know every time we're on the phone, 12 p.m., 1 p.m., 2 p.m., 3 p.m., 4 p.m., and 5 p.m., that's why. Because there's somebody who needs a shout of deliverance. And so we're not on there just because we're bored or we have the time. Some of us make sacrifices. I sometimes move meetings around so I can accommodate it. And I'm not there all the time. No, I'm not. But all we're asked to do is join one prayer time in the day. Because there's a shout of deliverance that needs to go out. Right? Psalm 30, Psalm 5, verse 11 and 12. It says, but let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them. That those who love your name may rejoice in you. Surely, Lord, you bless the righteous. You surround them with favor as with a shield. And that's what he does. He surrounds us with favor. He encircles us with favor. Why, Ruth? Because he knows that's what you need. You're going for an interview. You've done the best you know how. You don't get the job because you've done the best you know how. You don't get the job because of your skills and your qualifications. They have their place. You get the job because he surrounded you with favor. Amen. Amen. And so what's the point? Don't leave the circle. Where God has positioned you, stay there. Because whatever he's put around you, it's for a reason. Do you realize that the mountains, Mount Olive, Mount Moriah, Mount Zion, the Hill of Evil Council, do you realize that all of these 
mountains and hills that surround um, Jerusalem, that one day they're going to fall. One day they're going to be gone. Jerusalem city one day will be gone. But the one who surrounds you and I, he lives forever and ever and ever and ever. And nothing will cause him to fall. So you want to be surrounded. Amen. And so looking at this picture just really quick, I just want to kind of show you the mountains. For those who've been to Israel, these pictures are probably familiar. For those who haven't, well, here's Israel, okay? So we're in Israel. Um, so Mount Moriah is to the north again. Mount Olives is to the east. And by the way, I am completely directionally challenged when it comes to east, west, south, and north. I'm the kind, when I ask you where to go to get somewhere, don't say go east and then half a mile turn west. I have no idea what you're saying. Just say left and right. So because I have no idea what those directions mean, and I don't have a compass up here today. For today, this is north. Okay? It may not be, but for today, we're going north here. This is south. Elder Herb is holding the east. And this is west. Okay? Just for today. And then after that, you can go back to what it really is. <laughs> okay? And so Mount Zion is in the east. No, no, no. Mount Zion is in the west. Mount Olives is in the east. And the Hill of Evil Council is in the south, okay? And so what I really wanted to do today is I just want to share with you, I want us to look at who is it who surrounds us, right? We read in the scriptures that God surrounds, the mountains surround Jerusalem. But why did God put the mountains there? Why does that particular scripture there, what does it benefit in you and I, right? And so I asked God that. I really did. I said, so what does the scripture mean for me, though? <laughs> and he began to teach me and help me dig into it. And so I want to share just pieces of that with you. And by the way, my brother, if you just hit one button at a time, uh, one, the, um, blah, 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 what's that thing called? The page down key, they'll come in one. Uh, it has a transition going. So I should have said that before, so that's my fault. If it works, if it doesn't, we're good. Okay, so let's start with the east. Who's in the east? Which mountain? Ah, Mount Olive. They're listening, they're awake. Okay, all right, so the physical features, I want to read this just really quick just to give us an idea of the physical Mount Olive, what, uh, where it is and its height. It says, the Mount of Olives is a single peak of a two-mile long ridge that borders eastern Jerusalem forming a barrier between the city and the Judean wilderness to the east. The mile-long Mount of Olives proper is approximately 2,700 feet above sea level. It stands about 300 feet over the city, the city of Jerusalem here. The Mount's height is relative to the vicinity and its position around the city made in a natural bulwark, meaning it's doubling as a watchtower against Eastern invaders and as a token of protection, right? And so there was a specific purpose why God made it. God positioned, strategically positioned that mountain there. It didn't just, God was like, oh, where do we put this mountain and just threw it there, right? That's fine, no problem. So God strategically positioned it there, okay? But what does it mean? What did it mean to the people of Jerusalem? When they would see, be in their houses or be in their tents or whatever, and even up to now, when they're in their houses and they look out and they look on the east and they see that Mount Olive, what does it mean to them? Well, here's three things that the Lord showed me. It's a place of refuge, right? It's a place of refuge. It's where David escaped when he was running away from his son Absalom. That's where he went. He went to the Mount of Olives, and God gave him a place of refuge. Okay? We won't read all these scriptures, but um, I just put them there so you, maybe if you have a chance, you can read them if you wanted to look them up. And the second thing, the Mount of Olives is a place of rest. Now, historians have found and they um, have documented that it doesn't happen now, but in the time of the old Jerusalem, the people would 
they would come to Jerusalem, the people would come from other cities into Jerusalem to assemble for like the feast, right? We know about the feast that is recorded in Acts 2. And because there was no places to lodge or everywhere would be full, they would go to the Mount of Olives. Now, if you've been to the Mount of Olives, it really is just, it's a huge, well, to me it's huge, it's probably not that huge to everyone else, but it's a huge garden with olive trees. Okay, so here's the chilly bumping thing. The olive trees that are in the, in the, at the Mount of Olives, the day I went there, they were actually harvesting. It was, it was harvest time for the olives. And so they were harvesting olives. Those, our tour guide told us, the olives they're harvesting are the same olive trees that Jesus prayed under. If that doesn't give you chills, I don't know what does. Um, but it's, so the people would go there and they would rest. They would put tents and they would just rest there. And could it be possible then that as the people of Israel, as the people of Jerusalem are facing and looking at the Mount of Olives, could it be possible that God was reminding them, you're surrounded by rest because I'm here? Could it be possible that God was telling them, I don't care what your enemy says, you have refuge in me? Was it a reminder of who the God is that they serve, right? And then it was a place of assignment. Mount Olives is where Jesus, at the end of his time on earth, goes with his disciples and he ascends and he gives them an assignment, right? Go and make disciples of all nations, right? And he gives them that assignment. So it's a place of assignment. Could it be that God was reminding them that the purpose that you are on earth, people of Jerusalem, is that you're on an assignment? And you're probably thinking, Ruth, that is great. But what about me? I'm not in Jerusalem. Good. Let's read more. Second Kings, verse 6. Let me uh, give you just a little background of what this is. So Second Kings, verse, chapter 6, sorry, not verse 6. Chapter 6, Elisha, the prophet, at this point was um, alive. Elijah had gone on to the Lord, and Elisha was uh, the prophet, and he had all these students, but he also had a servant, right? And one of the things the Lord would do in those seasons is he would take the prophets, or he used the prophets, um, to be the advisor to the king at the time in the, in the land of, um, among the Jews, but also to the army, right? And so the army, he would, Elisha, God would, would just tell him what the king is saying, this foreign king would be saying, King um, Aram and other kings, and, and then he would go tell the, the, uh, the captains of the army and say, okay, they're going to attack you from the east coming up the corridor, so you need to put your men strategically there, and blah, 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 blah. And then they would, they would win the battle. And then the, the enemies would plan something else, and the Lord would tell Elisha, okay, this is the plan, this is what you go tell them. And so he'd go, okay, so now they're coming in from the, the south, but they think they're going to hide us, so you're going to go put your, and then win the battle. And so this king was like, he was getting so mad. Because he's like, how do they know exactly what we're planning? And so his servants, they found out, they went looking, they found out, and they said, oh, so there's this man called Elisha, who's a prophet among them. God tells him what's happening in your bedroom. And so he was like, oh, so let's get rid of the man. Right? So that's where we pick up. Okay. So one night, the king of Aram sent a great army with many chariots and horses to surround the city. When the servant of the man of God got up early the next morning, he went outside. There were troops, horses, chariots everywhere. Oh, sir, what will we do now? The young man cried to Elisha. Oh, don't be afraid, Elisha told him, for there are more on our side Elder Herb already said it today. There are more on our side than there are on theirs. And then Elisha prayed, Oh Lord, open his eyes, hallelujah, and let him see. Listen, if God has put you on an assignment, you can stay right there. If God has put you on an assignment, he knows you're on assignment. He does. And so, your focus cannot be, should not be, on the enemy who's trying to surround you, right? My prayer is that God would open our eyes, that we would stop focusing 
like this servant did, on the eyes of the enemy. That's not where our focus is supposed to be, people of God. Our focus is on the one who surrounds the enemies who are surrounding us. That's where our focus is, right? And so even if you're in a place of refuge, if you're going through a hard time in a relationship, on your job, in your business, in your physical anatomy, and you're in that place of refuge, and you're saying, God, just take me. Just get me out. Just end it. And you keep saying, God, why aren't you just doing it? You're on assignment. So instead of crying out that way, cry out this way. God, open my eyes that I may see. Past this one that's surrounding me, past this enemy, past this thing that's trying to take me out. And God, when I'm too tired, give me rest. Give me rest. God is saying, look, I've already encircled you on the east side. You're fine. How many believe it? You're fine. You have refuge. You have rest. Even in your assignment. Amen. Amen. All right, so what about on the north? Who's in the north? Ah, he showed you. <laughs> Mount Moriah. Okay, good. Mount Moriah, right? And so just a little bit about physical features of Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah is, the, is to the north of Jerusalem, and it's approximately 2,428 feet above sea level, which implies that it stands just slightly above the city of Jerusalem, but it's still tall, right? And so, why did God encircle them with Mount Moriah? What was the importance of it? Well, let's look at some of the things, and these are just three of them, right? We'll start with the place of meeting. So, it's the place where God appeared to David. If you go and you read 2 Chronicles 3, God appears to David there. It's also the place where God appeared to Jacob in Genesis 28. Do you remember the story of Jacob and how he... Uh, he was running away because he had done some really bad things, and he laid down to sleep, and then he had a vision, and he saw this ladder that was from the earth to the heavens, right? And then it says, and I find this so interesting, I don't know how many people have studied it, it doesn't say he saw angels descending and ascending, it says he saw angels ascending and descending, Right? So God meets with him there, and God has a conversation with him, and I'll let you go read the conversation. But he says, surely God is in this place. So it's, it's a place of meeting. And so could it be that God was telling the people of Jerusalem who would wake up and they would have a horrible day or their enemies were fighting them from every side and they would see the Mount of Moriah as God's reminder that I'm here to meet with you. I'm here to meet with you. Right? And then it's also a place of testing. It's where Abraham went to sacrifice his son, Isaac, right? And so can you imagine God telling you, I'm going to give you this wonderful, wonderful, amazing number of children. You're just going to have a wonderfully large family. And you're like, yes, God. And then a day goes by and a month goes by and a year goes by. And you're like, Lord. <laughs> I'm still here, you know, and years go by. And finally, you have this child, and he grows up because Isaac was not a, he wasn't, he wasn't young, young. He was, they say he was probably um, in his early 20s, maybe, right? So he wasn't a little boy. And after all those years, God tells you, okay, now go sacrifice him. And you're thinking, did I hear you right? Did you mean my son Isaac or the lamb we call Isaac? Which one were you talking about, God? <laughs> and he says, no, my son. Take your son and go sacrifice him. And so you go, and so here was Abraham going, and he's getting ready to sacrifice his son. It was a test. God says, now I know that you fear me. It was a test, right? And so could it be that the children of Israel in Jerusalem would look to Mount Moriah on days when they're like, this is it. If God doesn't answer this thing and this thing continues to happen, I'm done. I'm throwing in the towel. And could it be that God would remind them, it's just a test, right? 
And it's also, it was a place of God's resting place, right? It's where Solomon, the son of David, built the first temple. So could it be God was telling them, I'm right here, right? We already saw in Mount Olive, he said, I'm here, come, come with me. But here he is again saying, I'm right here. Come meet with me, I'm right here, right? And what about for us today? What does it mean? The thing I love about God is he doesn't just encircle us. He stands in the midst of us. And so I was trying to, I couldn't even think, like, I was like, what picture can I show them that will show that? I don't even have a picture in my mind like that. How can God be in the middle of us and at the same time, he's encircling us? But that's what he does, right? And so he's always positioned, he's always with us. And so Second um, Chronicles 5, it talks about after Solomon has built the temple. And listen to this, it says, So Solomon finished all, the, all his work at the temple of the Lord, then he brought all the gifts to his father, this verse 1 and 2, that his father David had dedicated, the silver, the gold, the various articles, and he stored them in the treasures of the temple of God. Solomon then summoned to Jerusalem the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the leaders of the ancestral families of Israel. And they were to bring the ark of the Lord's covenant, amen, to the temple from its location in the city of David, which is also known Zion, as Zion. In verse 11, if we jump down, it says, then the priests left the holy place. All the priests who were present had purified themselves, whether or not they were on duty. We need to always be ready. Always be ready. You can't pray just when you know you're up to serve or to do something. You're always ready. And the Levites who were, who were musicians, Aspen, Heman, and uh, Jeduthun, and all, the son, all their sons and brothers were dressed in fine linen robes and stood at the east side of the altar playing cymbals and lyres and herps, harps. And they were joined by the 120 priests who were playing trumpets. And the trumpeters and the singers performed together in unison to praise and give thanks to the Lord, accompanied by trumpets and cymbals and other instruments. They raised their voices and they praised the Lord. Hallelujah. And this is what they said. He's good. Hallelujah. His faithfulness, his faithful love endures forever. And at that moment, a thick cloud filled the temple of the Lord. Hallelujah. The priests could not continue with their service because of the cloud, for the glorious presence of the Lord filled the temple. Listen, God wants to meet with us. He wants to meet with us. He says, I've already pitched tent in Metro. I'm here. Where are you? Right? He wants to meet with us. He's never um, saying, you got to go look for me. I'm out there somewhere. Just hope you find me. He says, well, I'm right here. I want to meet with you. And so the question is, where are we? The word Moriah, uh, Moriah, the Mount Moriah, it was up earlier. You don't have to turn back, bro. But the word Moriah, Mori, means to see or to understand. That's what it means in Hebrew. And Yah, we know, means Lord. So it's to understand the Lord. And so Mount Moriah, the place where we meet with God, it's a place where he gives us understanding. Right? And so just like the children of Israel where God put this mountain strategically in front of them on the north side called the Mount Moriah, he said, come here to learn and understand me. Come here where I'm testing you. Listen, the tests of God are not to pull us away from God. Never see a test from God as a bad thing. A test from your biology professor, probably so. But a test from God is a good thing, right? because he's only bringing you closer to him. There's something about when God tests us. If we're moving in the right direction, there's something about what God, when God tests us, 
we keep going after him, right? We keep going after him. Someone says, okay, come, I'll pray. It'll take maybe two hours. I don't care. You pray. Okay, we're going to pray all night for your son. Okay, let's, let's, pray, let's pray. It brings you closer to him, right? Because he only wants us to understand, it's my resting place. I'm already here, right? And so that is what God is looking for you and I. Where are the ones who understand? God has already encircled you in the north. He got you on the east. Now he's in the north. And he says, I have you. Right? I have you. I've already encircled you. As, as the mountains surround Jerusalem, so I'm surrounding you. And all you and I have to do is to stay there and trust him. Right? All right, so Mount Olives in the east, Mount Moriah in the north. Who's in the west? Who? Mount Zion. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, Mount Zion is in the west. So Mount Zion, um, it's a, spe a specific, historically important location um, for two reasons. Really, the name talks about the mountain, Okay, but it also talks about the city, and we saw that in what we just read um, earlier. And sometimes it talks about the people. It just had, it kept getting interchanged, really. But there was an actual, phys there is an actual physical site, a mount called Mount Zion, and it's in the west. And it protects Jerusalem from the west. Now, one interesting thing about Mount Zion is it's the highest point of all the mountains, okay? Now, I'm only sharing with you, I should have said this earlier, I'm only sharing with you four of the mountains today, or hills. Um, theologians, scholars, anyone who's researching, they say there could be, there's seven mountains surrounding Jerusalem, and there probably are, right? But we're just looking at four of them today that have a meaning, and one of the one that everybody agrees is Mount Zion, right? It protects Jerusalem. Up to today, it protects Jerusalem. And so... But what did it mean at the time? What was so significant that God strategically created that mountain and put it to the west for his people? Why did he do that? Why didn't he put it to the north or the south? What was about this place? Well, there's three things that I, um, I found. There's, there's probably more, but there's three things that I found that I want to share. One, it's a place of identity. It's where God identified his people. In Revelations 14, John, as he was on the island of Patmos, and God was giving him these revelations, right, that he later recorded for you and I uh, to read. He says this, that I looked and behold on Mount Zion, hallelujah, stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name. Amen written on their foreheads. So it's a place of identity, right? John saw it and he saw it. On that mountain, God identified who was his. So could it be that God was doing it so that the people in Jerusalem could understand when they wake up and they're like, I don't even know whose I am anymore. I feel like I just, I've lost it. I don't have any identity. And God would say, look to the west. And they would look and there they would see Mount, Mount Moriah and remember, oh, I am identified in the eyes of God. Right? What about a place of divine turnarounds? I love this. It's where things in your life that have been depleted, demolished, God starts reviving them. <laughs> God starts calling things that aren't as if they are. Isaiah 51, verse 3. It says, For the Lord comforts Zion. Now he's talking more so about the people. In the city. The Lord comforts Zion. He comforts all her waste places. And he makes her wilderness like Eden. Eden was very fertile, right? Her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her thanksgiving and the voice of song. Listen, God is the God who will turn things around that people say can never, ha can never be changed, right? And Zion was a perfect example. God said, I'm going to turn this thing around. Could it be that God wanted the people to understand that even though it looks like there's no hope for you, just open your eyes and turn to the west and remember what I did 
all those years ago. Amen. And then it's a place of communion. I love this. It's a place of communion. It's where Jesus had the Last Supper with his disciples. So it's a place of breaking bread, but it's also a place where God nourishes the souls. As Jesus was communing with his disciples, and it was the Last Supper, I mean, I don't think they had really got an understanding of that's what it was, but he knew it. And so he was feeding them, and I always say it's the best meal ever, right? That communion cup we take, it is the best meal ever. Because it was prescribed to us by Jesus. No man made it up. It's from Jesus himself. So anytime you get the privilege and the honor to take the communion, always remember, you are taking the best meal ever, right? And so could it be that Jesus, that God, wanted these people to remember, this is a place of communion. When you feel all alone, when you feel, I can't handle this anymore, turn to Mariah and look at, and remember what God did there. Remember what Christ did there. He communed, right? But there's another verse that I want to share with you. And it's in Deuteronomy 32, verse 10. And so this is the Lord talking about his people, right? It says, but the, Lord, the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob, his allotted heritage. He found him in the desert land and in the hollowing waste of the wilderness. And what did he do? encircled him. There it is again. And he cared for him and he kept him as the apple of his eye. Here, I got to stop for a minute. So listen, so what, what, uh, what was written, to, what was recorded for us by, they believe it's Moses who recorded this, but what was recorded for us was that God Jacob is in, in the midst of his enemies taking him out. The Israelites, things are bad, things are thick. They're in a place that's like a wilderness. And it's not just any wilderness. It's a hollowing waste wilderness, right? And so God, it says he goes and he finds him there, right? Hollowing waste talks about it's not just a dry place. It's a dry place. You've got wild beasts out there. It's... It's toxic for your health. It's terrible. And God says, I'm coming for you. In that place that seems impossible, I'm coming for you. And when he gets there, God doesn't just say, okay, I'm here, let's go. No, he encircles you. Because he's protecting them from anything that's coming to take them out. And he does the exact same thing for you and I. And he doesn't just do that. It says he cared for him. God begins to care for them. It says he keeps him. He guides him. It's the same thing he does for you and I. The very same thing, right? He cares for us and he protects us and he watches over us. And the thing I love, the one that I love the most is that it says that he kept him as the apple of his eye. Do you understand what the apple of the eye is? It's the pupil. The pupil is the apple of the eye. It's that very most important part of the eye. Now, here's what I want us to think about, right? Think about all the things that the only way you can accomplish them is because you can see, right? Have you ever done that? Have you ever, like, just for, I, I think the most I did was five minutes and I had to give up, but have you ever closed your eyes for five minutes and tried to do things? It's hard, right? So hats off to people who are blind and have been for years and are able to do a lot because it's hard. And so what he's saying is God has made him the apple of his. That it's that precious to God. And you are that precious to God. You are that precious to the Lord, right? So when he says, I'll commune with you, he's not just saying it flip hazardly. You are so precious that he wants to commune with you. Every single one of us. He wants to spend time with us. He wants to care. He wants to uh, keep us, which means to guard us. He wants to give us direction. You're that important. And when he does it, and as he does it, he's already encircling us. 
He's already surrounding us so that that which is on the outside can't attack us. It may look like it can, but it can't, right? And so that is so important to remember about our God. And so finally, now we're going to the south because we are encircled on the east. We're encircled on the north. We're encircled on the west. And what's in the south? Does anyone remember? Yes, the hill of evil counsel. What is standing on the hill of evil counsel today? I was looking for Connie because I bet she knows this answer. I was going to tell her she can't answer it, but she's not here. So what is, what is standing on the, evil, the ground of the evil, and it's still called that same name, by the way, evil, uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, the ground of, uh, the hill of evil counsel today. Anybody have a clue? Nope, Temple Mount, Mount Moriah. Good, good, uh, good guess. The UN. Yeah. I'm just going to leave it there. Okay, because I do need to live tomorrow. Okay? Um, so um, it's a place of suffering. It's a place of wickedness. It's believed that, it's not believed, it's, it's documented that at, on evil, the hill of evil council, I can't even say it, um, Cephas and the Israelite leaders, that's where they conspired to arrest Jesus. It's also the place that Judah went to get his silver to betray Jesus. It's an evil place. And it springs out of the, the Valley of Hinnom. The Valley of Hinnom was known as a very wicked people. They committed adultery. They, they, were, just, they were evil in the sight of God. So here's the question. Ruth, if it is that evil, why on earth would God surround Jerusalem with it? That is a great question because that's why I asked God too. I said, God, how can you take this hill? It's not even a mountain because it's really not that uh, tall and considered a mountain. But God acknowledges it. Some, some places call it the mountain of corruption. Okay. But God put it there. Why would they ever want to turn south to a place that seems impossible to give them any encouragement? Let's read, right? So in Job 1, if you know the story of Job, if you don't, I encourage you to just go and read the verses, the five verses before this, just to really get an understanding of uh, the, the life of this man called Job. Do you know that there are Christians not non-believers, I'm talking about Christians. Christians, I, was, I heard about this a couple months ago and I was like, are you serious? Who believe that the story of Job is fake? Yeah. Know your Bible for yourself. Because the things that are coming up now, as man is, knowledge is puffing up, is, is sad. Um, it's crazy. Okay, so Job says this in verse 6. Or rather, it's documented this in verse 6. It says, One day the members of the heavenly court came to present themselves before the Lord, and the accuser, Satan, came with them. Where have you come from? The Lord asked Satan. Satan answered the Lord, I've been patrolling the earth. I've been watching everything that's going on, and he does it to today. Then the Lord asked Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? He's the finest man in all the earth. Can you imagine Jesus saying that about you? I mean, I'm happy that he calls me his child. Don't get me wrong. I'm super happy about that. But can you imagine him saying, have you considered Ruth? She's fine. Inside and outside. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but he says, he says, so he's the finest man on earth. He is blameless, a man of complete integrity. I mean, I always keep saying that there are, there are a handful of people that I always say, oh, when I get to heaven, I'm going to look for so, so, so. People are like, you're going to forget. I'm like, I'm not going to forget. I'm going to look for them. He's one of them, right? Because his, his, the way God describes, not man, the way God describes him, I'm like, I've got to meet this man, right? He is the finest man in all the earth. He's blameless, a man of complete integrity. He fears God, and he stays away from evil. And Satan replied to the Lord, Yes, but Job has a good reason to fear God. You have always, oh, I love that word. Even the enemy knows it. You have always put a wall of protection (laughs) 
around him. Even the enemy knows you have a wall of protection around you. So when he whispers to you that you don't, remind him this verse, right? Because he said, God has always put protection. And he says, and his home and his property, and you have made him prosper in everything he does. Look how rich he is. But reach out and take away everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. Right? And so that's what the enemy said. He said, just touch him. Just get rid of that circle hedge thing you have around him and watch what he does. <laughs> but Job's fear of God, it wasn't limited to the wall of protection that God had around him, and nor should ours be, right? How do I know that? Because even when the enemy was allowed to test Job, Job still refused to curse God. He wouldn't. When everything was taken from him, his children, his land, his servants, his status in society, Everything was taken from Job. His friends started talking crazy about him, right? Here's one thing I want to say real quickly. When you see somebody suffering, don't assume you know that it's sin. We don't know people's stories, right? Job's friends, they got it wrong. Thank the Lord he had Job pray for them later and it was okay. But don't ever assume that we're so sure they sinned. And even if God tells you, yes, so-and-so sinned, that's why they're suffering, it's not for you to tell the world. It's for you to pray for them. Don't tell a soul. Don't hold a prayer meeting. Let me just call Ruth and Ms. Jeanette and we can pray for this person. Thus says the Lord, they have sinned. No. You take up the assignment. And you pray for that person, okay? All right. So Job was not, it wasn't that God had a wall of protection. It wasn't his fear of God had nothing to do with the wall of protection because he didn't curse God, right? He kept on going in his pain. Now, if you go read the book of Job, I'm towards the end of a study with a, a group of people on the book of Job. Job suffered. When I say this man suffered, <laughs> He suffered. I can't remember what chapter it is now, but there's a chapter where he talks about who he was in society. Oh, my word. He fell from so high. He suffered, but he would not curse God. And he stood and he believed God. And you're probably thinking, why did he remain so righteous, Ruth? Job 19 has an answer for us. Job says this, he says, oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. Oh, that an iron pen, with an iron pen and lead. Job, we got you. It's written. We got you. And he says, for I know that my Redeemer lives. And at the last, he will stand upon the earth. Job got it. He was that close with God. There's, I think it's chapter 24 or 20, nah, it's not 24. So I think it's 26 or 28. Job says that God was actually a friend in his tent. They used to converse like that, right? And so Job had such an assurance that God lived, that his redeemer lived. And what does a redeemer mean, right? A redeemer means, if I can find my notes, if I can't, I'm just gonna, oh, here it is. So a redeemer means one who brings you to safety, one who avenges on your behalf, one who reclaims you back. And we know God reclaimed Job back, right? And so Job understood that. He said, my redeemer lives. Could it be that God wanted the children of Israel in Jerusalem to look to the south so that when they thought it was over, when they thought, God, I've gone through so much suffering, I can't take it anymore, they would look and they would remember, my redeemer lives. I can do this. How many of us need that reminder? And then I love what Job continues to say. He says in verse 26, he says, after my skin has been thus destroyed and yet in my flesh, he says, I'm going to see God. And just in case we didn't hear it, he says it again in verse 27, whom I shall see for myself. I'm going to see God. And then he says, oh, you didn't get me. So then he says, and my eyes shall behold God. Over and over he keeps saying, I I'm encouraging myself because I have no one else to encourage me. 
My friends aren't encouraging my wife. Ooh, she's gone crazy. So Job says, I'm going to turn to the south. And I'm going to look for my redeemer and I'm going to encourage myself. Where are the Job's today? The ones who will stand up and say, God, I know you've got me. I have hope upon hope upon hope that you got me. Could it be that God put that heel of evil back there on the south of Jerusalem to remind them and us, your Redeemer lives? Hallelujah. And Job understood hope because in Job 14, listen what he says. I love this verse. This gives me chills. Chapter 14, sorry. He says, for there is hope for a tree. Love this. If it is cut down, it will sprout again. And we know it happens, does it not? And that its tender shoots will not cease. Though its root may grow old in the earth and its stump may die in the ground, yet at the scent ekato, yet at the scent of water, it will bud and bring forth branches like a plant. At the scent, some of you need to get the scent of the Holy Spirit. So that when, you, when things are hard, you say, you say, my Redeemer lives, I know he's there, he's surrounding me. He's in my south. It may look horrible in my south, but he's there. And I've always wondered, God, was this the hill that the psalmist saw in Psalm 120, was it 122 or 121? When he writes, 122, when he writes and says, I look to the hills. Was it this evil hill? Where he said, I'm looking at this hill. Where's my help come from? It doesn't come from this hill that's surrounding me. It comes from the one who surrounds the hill that's surrounding me. There is a God, Metro. There is a God, and he's encircling us. He is encircling us. So don't look at the things that are challenging and hard and say, God, you're not encircling. He's encircling. He's, it's just a reminder. Your Redeemer lives. Your Redeemer lives. I don't know who's on the live stream. Your Redeemer lives. And there's hope. All you need is the scent. And when you get that scent, those shoots are growing. Hallelujah. 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 So I'm going to end with this. How do we stay, though? How do we stay in circle? If you remember when I started, I said, you got to stay there, right? You got to stay encircled around God. Don't try to get out on the east or cut a door or build a tunnel in the south. You've got to stay there. How do we stay there? Number one, you stay in position. Keep your position. We read verse 2 of Psalm 125. Now verse 1. This is just 1, not 2. Uh, it says this. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion. They cannot be moved. They abide forever. Listen. The people in Galilee did not get the benefits of the people in Jerusalem. It's the people of Jerusalem who had the mountains surrounding them. If they decided to go to Galilee, you can go, but you just left the circle. So there is a high chance the enemy's going to get you. Where are the ones who need to stay in position? Where are the ones who've left the position of the Lord? Get back in position. Stay in the circle. Ruth, I need this. It's in the circle. I don't see it. Ask the Lord to open your eyes. It's in the circle. Stay in the circle. And two, stay weapon ready and gaze fine-tuned. Your, your gaze and the Lord should be so fine-tuned, like Job, that even in a place of suffering, you still see your Redeemer. Right? Hebrews 11, I love this scripture, and I'm sure many of you do. But Hebrews 11, verse 1 and then we're going to jump down to uh, chapter 11, verse 1, and then jump down to chapter 12. 11, which we all know is called the, the chapter of faith. It says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. And then I kind of cut it off there. But then uh, ver chapter 12, it says this. Therefore, since we already are surrounded 
by a great cloud of witnesses. Listen, there's others who've gone before us. Hebrews 11, if you have never read it, that's the, great, that's the cloud of witness it's talking about. Go back and read it. All of those who, in faith, they did this. In faith, they did this. In faith, they did this. And we don't even know names of most of them, right? That's the other group I'm going to look for in heaven. Uh, we don't know the names of most of them, but in faith, they did it. We're surrounded at them. What are they doing? They're cheering us on. They've already said, you can get through it. I got through it. Right? They're cheering us on. And so the, the writer of Hebrew, he says, we're surrounded by a great cloud of witness. Let us also lay aside every weight and every sin which clings so closely. And let's begin to run, Metro. Let's begin to run with endurance, right, this race that's in front of us. Let's begin to run. Let's let go of every sin and everything that's clinging on to us. And let's start running, right? That's the first part of it. That's weapon ready. Get your faith, sh your faith shields ready. But here's the second part. Verse 2, looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility, hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Where is your gaze? Who are you looking at as you're walking, as you're running this race? Who are you looking at? I can't remember who it was. I think it was Elder Marshall who said it last Sunday. Somebody said it. Don't, it was him. Don't keep your gaze on other Christians. Fellowship with other Christians. Your gaze is Jesus. It is nobody. He's not here, but I know he'd be okay with me saying, your gaze is not Bishop. It is not Pastor Brenda. I love them to bits and pieces and back. Your gaze is Jesus. And we have got to get that in the, in the center of our, whole, of our souls. You've got to be gaze focused. You've got to be fine-tuned into what the Lord is showing you, right? And number three, we'll stop here, remember the mountains. And I don't say remember the mountains so you can worship them. Don't worship them. Don't worship a place of refuge. Don't worship your assignment. Don't worship um, your identity in Christ. Don't worship even your communion with God. Don't worship it. That's not what it means. The mountains remind you to worship the God who created the mountains. The God who's giving you refuge, that's who you worship. The God who gives you rest, that's who you worship. The God who wants to meet with you, that's who you worship. The God who takes you out of a place of suffering and helps you as you're going through, that's who you worship. But there are some in this room and online, you've got to remember the mountains. You've got to go, and for some of you, it's, it's Mount Olive, right? You need rest in God. You need an understanding of your assignment. For some, it's Mount Moriah on the, in the north, right? You are so lost in your testing that you are not meeting with God. You're trying to go through this test on your own strength and in your own strength. You're going to fail. For some of us, it's our identity. It's Zion in the West, and we don't remember who we are. We don't. And so we don't commune with God. You need to remember who you are. Remember the mountains. And for some of us, it's that hill of evil counsel in the South. Right? And you've got to understand, God, even in my suffering, even when I don't get it, I'll be honest, I was the first. When we got the text yesterday, I said, God, I don't know why the baby left. And I was honest with him because I'm honest with God. And I said, God, but it hurts me. I know you're good. I know you're right. I know you did the right thing. But it hurts. And when you're honest with God, he can be honest to your healing. And he can be honest in helping you. When Job was honest, God began to throw questions at him. And God began to heal. And for some of you, don't fear that heal of evil counsel. 
be honest with God, God, I'm suffering and it hurts. And I know you encircle me, but I can't feel it today. And let him heal you. Amen. Amen. So here's the last one, and I'm going to stop here. The last, the last um, slide there. I want to point out something that's really important because I don't want anyone to get confused. In Psalm 125, verse 2, we already read it. But I put it here at the bottom because I want you to see it yet again. It says, Jerusalem, mountains are around it. And Yahweh, he's around his people. It's not just everybody. Ruth, that isn't fair. I know, but I'm not God. He's around his people. And so here's the question. Are you encircled? Do, are you his people today? If you're not, you're in the right place. If you're watching, don't change the channel. You're in the right place. He encircles his people. And if you don't know him, by golly, the best choice you can make in 2023 is to know him. Because there is no safe way to live out this season that we're in, spiritually and physically, emotionally, politically, outside of his circle. You're taking a huge risk. And all you got to do is say, God, I, I just want to be in your circle. I just want to know you. And before I hand it back to Elder Marshall, I'm going to pray that for you today. So are there any, if you are on live stream, they're going to tell you how you can get a hold of us. But if that's you and you're on the live stream, would you just join us in prayer? Are there any in this room? never given their lives to Jesus, who aren't in his circle. Are there any? And if there are in the live stream, I want to pray with you. There are none in the room. So God, we, we're so humbled and we're so thankful that you surround us. We thank you for the physical reminders that you surround us, Mount Olive and Mount Moriah, Mount Zion, and the Hill of Evil Council. We thank you for the reminders. And Lord, I come with these ones who do not know you by name, but want to be part of that circle that you surround, those people that you surround. And I lift them up today. If that's you, just, just repeat after me and say, Jesus, I want to know you. I want you to encircle me. Forgive me for my sins. I turn from them today. I come to you. I want to belong to you. And in faith I know I am. So I give you my life. And from this day forward, God, I am yours, and you are mine. I accept you as my Father, God, and I live for you. Amen. And for anyone else here who you've been wrestling and struggling to find your place, because you've never really realized that God has encircled you. I pray for you that God would, would open your eyes today as you're driving home or to your place of responsibility, as you're in your home fellowshipping or as you go to bed tonight, that God would show you the places where you are not trusting that he's encircled you. And those who've walked out of the circle of God backslidden or any other way I pray that God would help you God touch your children open our eyes Lord as you open that servant's eyes may your glory fill these earthly temples God 
Thank you for encircling us, Jesus. Baba, we love you. Amen. Won't you give minister Ruth a big God bless you for that powerful word of the Lord. Amen. Let's stand as we receive that word this morning. Was that really truly rich this morning? Wow. He encircled his people. There's so many things I, you know, wrote down there one scripture he reminded me of when you were ministering God reminding us that he really got us therefore I tell you do not worry about your life he reminded me of Matthew 6 what you will eat what you would drink or about your body what you will wear is not your life more than food and the body more than clothes look at the birds of the air they do not sow or reap or store away in barns and yet your heavenly father feeds them are you not much more valuable than they can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life and why do you worry about clothes see how the flowers of the field grow they do not labor or spin Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. So do not worry saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and all his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well therefore do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself each day has enough trouble of its own so, Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for reminding us that you are the one who has and is encircled about us. Thank you for reminding us, God, that we can commune, fellowship with you. Thank you, Lord, for your servant who diligently sought you. To share your heart to your people and we give you praise remind us Lord that thou art a shield about us the glory and the lifter up of our heads now Lord bless your people may you encourage them this day we give you praise and we give you glory in Jesus name amen Amen. God bless you. Go in the strength of the Lord. If you need prayer, this altar is open. We will pray for you and pray with you that you will be victorious in the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Minister Ruth. God bless you. Thank you, brothers. Amen.